Right, okay, I guess I'll start. Um, first thing I want to say is a massive spoiler alert. So if you haven't seen Star Wars, um, you're, not, you're in the wrong place. Um, if you haven't seen Stargate, Arc of Truth, if you haven't seen Firefly or Serenity, and if you haven't seen Red Dwarf and you want to, this is the wrong talk because spoilers. Okay, so that out the way, we'll start. So basically the dilemmas of sci-fi is gonna be a whistle-stop tour of ethics using science fiction to explain it. So one of the main reasons I chose to combine science fiction and ethics is that the wonderful thing about sci-fi as a genre is it always features a problem. And these problems are generally huge, like saving the world. And the consequences are massive. You know, really your hero should be sitting down and going, am I doing the right thing? They don't. We've seen this. They blunder in and somehow they save the day. So really one of the best things is that I can probably give you is maybe next time you're watching it and you sit back and go, are these heroes actually being heroes? I don't know. So one of the first theories I'm going to talk about is natural law. Now this was first created by Aristotle, that old Greek guy far back, and um, basically this 12th century monk called Thomas Aquinas kind of crept along and kind of sponged off him. I really don't like Aquinas. So <laughs> he basically came up with something called natural law, which was how he believed people should um, live their lives with the aim of reaching eudaimonia. Now, eudaimonia is a Greek word meaning human flourishing. So basically, you should aim to be perfect and happy. So he, Aristotle and kind of Aquinas later, he created the word telos, which in Greek means purpose. So this argument is teleological, meaning it concerns yourself with the purpose of what you're doing and what you should be kind of aiming for. So they believe that you are supremely good or perfect when you're achieving your purpose. And they believe that apparently your purpose should be happiness. So obviously you're thinking, how can I be happy? So Aquinas decided to come up with rules because that works. He came up with something called the five primary precepts. These were to reproduce to worship God, to live in an ordered society, to preserve life, and I've forgotten the other one. Give me a minute. <laughs> oh, and to educate the young. There we go. So, yeah, they're kind of five easily forgettable precepts, so you can understand why would you live by them. They're all pretty vague as well. I mean, to preserve life, what does that even mean? So Aquinas kind of covered his but, for want of a better word, to create the secondary precepts, which were basically to say, to preserve life, you shouldn't kill, for example. So I think one of the best examples I could find in science fiction of what might be the perfect example of natural law is Arnold Rimmer. So hopefully this will work. going on. I've actually got someone else's PowerPoint. All tap, yeah? Hey, there we go. I won't touch it. So basically, that's Arnold Rimmer. Um, pretty pathetic. Uh, I think we can all agree. 
But, however, he does fulfil Aquinas's precepts somewhat. I mean, in this point, he's had his anger removed by some crazy creature, if you didn't catch that. But he does worship God. He does attempt to reproduce. He's not successful. Obviously, they're about three million years in deep space. He does try to educate the young, if we count Lister. Lister never learns. I mean, and so obviously we can argue that he tries to live in an order society by obeying the rules and just generally trying to be a good person. But obviously, as you guys may know, he is what we affectionately call him, a smeghead. He is a bit of a twat. So obviously, he's not happy. So even if he's following Aquinas' grand rules, what's going wrong? Aquinas might argue that he's not doing it right. Obviously, he's failing to reproduce. He's failing to educate. So if you fail, basically you're doomed to be unhappy. You can kind of see where that's going wrong. So this is why natural law has kind of been kicked to the curb. So going on, we have utilitarianism. Now, this is a theory I think most people will end up recognizing as a thought pattern that's generally used in society. It was originally created by Jeremy Bentham. This was a guy who actually was involved with a lot of political reforms of our country. So his kind of, I think, maxim is the best way to use, was the term, the greatest good for the greatest number. So whatever action you should take should be a right action if it benefits the most people. So that seems reasonable, somewhat. But actually, there are flaws in this logic, and I think this is one of the best examples of it. I'll try not to press any buttons again. These are just a few of the images we've recorded. And you can see it isn't what we thought. There's been no war here and no terraforming event. The environment is stable. It's the past. G23 Paxil and Hydrochlory that we added to the air processors. It was supposed to calm the population, weed out aggression. Well, it works. The people here stopped fighting. And then they stopped everything else. They stopped going to work. They stopped breathing. So again, major spoiler alert. But um, Serenity is one of the best films that kind of shows you utilitarianism because they try to do the greatest thing for the greatest number. They try to create an entire world where peace was kind of enforced upon you by drugs. But they figured, yeah, why wouldn't you want a peaceful world? So they do it. But the greatest good for the greatest number isn't always the best thing because they didn't think it through. They end up killing half the people, and then the 10% turn into reavers, which kill those of other people. So again, that is one of the major flaws with Jeremy Bentham's ideas. So a student of his, John Stuart Mill, decided to come and kind of revamp his idea by creating higher and lower pleasures of utilitarianism. And this became something known as rule utilitarianism, as opposed to Bentham's act. So with these higher and lower pleasures, he believed that Lower pleasures are those of the body, so lust, gluttony, all kind of more of the sins, which I think we can agree is embodied by Jane as a character from Firefly. You know, he's all about the lower pleasures, whereas the higher pleasures are those of the mind. And we'll go with Simon for that one, because, you know, he's intelligent, he likes to read, he likes to be smart. 
you know, there's nothing wrong with these guys. They're both happy. But there is one of the fundamental flaws is that Firefly shows you that these guys both make mistakes. You know, nothing is foolproof, even with your higher and lower pleasures, because if you stick to one and not the other, you're kind of just doing it wrong anyway. So, again, utilitarianism in, in the concept is great. You know, you should be doing the greatest thing for the most people, helping others. But you really have to think about the consequences. The next one is virtue ethics. Now, this was created by Aristotle. Aquinas didn't sponge off him. And um, he basically decided that to be a good person, you should be virtuous. You should practice your virtues and you should be perfect like that. Now, this theory differs from the others in the fact that it is agent-centered. Now, agent-centered, as opposed to act-centered, means you look at yourself as opposed to the action you are taking. So to, be, to reach this eudaimonia that Aristotle so believed in, you had to think about making yourself perfect as opposed to making others around you perfect. So I think one of the best examples I could find was actually Star Wars, would you believe? <laughs> and um, this is what I have chosen to show that will hopefully help you understand virtue ethics. Yoda spoke of another. The other he spoke of is your twin sister. But I have no sister. To protect you both from the Emperor, you were hidden from your father when you were born. The Emperor knew, as I do, if Anakin were to have any offspring, they would be a threat to him. That is the reason why your sister remains safely anonymous. So yeah, spoiler alert again. Um, <laughs> I warned you guys. Um, so now we've got sound. I do apologise for anything you cannot see or hear before. Um, but yeah, Star Wars is actually a very interesting aspect of virtue ethics. Because, as you said, the force. It's kind of a bit of a 50-50. And this is precisely what Aristotle was talking about. Because his kind of maxim, to put it into kind of today's terms, is practice makes perfect. To be virtuous, you should practice virtuous acts. So if we take the virtue courage, if you wanted to be courageous, you should do courageous acts. If we use Luke as an example, he becomes courageous because he does courageous acts like leaving his home planet, like leaving his friends to train with Yoda, and the more courageous acts he does, the more he becomes courageous. 
However, like Obi Wan said, it his father turned out evil. So how does that happen if his father was originally courageous? Now, if we go back to the previous films or after films, however it works, um, Anakin obviously started out good. He was courageous. But he actually embodies one of the greatest things that Aristotle said with virtue ethics, and this was called the golden mean. Now, he said, virtues are essentially in the middle, and this is what you want to be. You want to be in the middle. And you want to avoid the vices, which are basically deficiencies or excesses of these vices, uh, virtues. So if we take courage again, Anakin starts off courageous, he starts being good, he does courageous acts. But the more he attempts to be good, the more he does too many courageous acts, and he becomes so determined to keep the ones he loves that he begins to just keep doing these supposedly good acts until he turns to the dark side. So in Aristotle's case, his courage turns to rashness because he uses too much of his virtue without thinking it through. So in terms of virtue ethics, in terms of being happy, you should always aim for kind of the middle path and just do these good acts while thinking about how it will make you a better person rather than thinking about how it benefits other people, which again is the down put fall because you will fall to the dark side, potentially. Um, the next example is Kantian ethics. Now this was created by Immanuel Kant and he, was, he took a very objective approach to ethics which meant everything is right or wrong, there is no grey area. And he was very strict about it. He believed that you should be doing the right thing by doing your duty, duty for duty's sake. You shouldn't allow emotions or desires to cloud what you're doing. So we're going to actually go back to Serenity because I think there is a character who embodies Kantian ethics quite well. I'm sorry. If your quarry goes to ground, leave no ground to go to. You should have taken my offer. Or did you think none of this was your fault? I don't murder children. I do. If I have to. Why? Do you even know why they send you? It's not my place to ask. I believe in something greater than myself. A better world. A world without sin. So me and mine gotta lay down and die so you can live in your better world? I'm not going to live there. There's no place for me there, any more than there is for you. Malcolm, I'm a monster. What I do is evil. I have no illusions about it, but it must be done. Keep talking. You're not getting a location trace off this wave. And every minute you keep River Tam from me, more people will die. You think I care? Of course you care. You're not a Reva Mal. You're a human man, and you will never understand how... a better world. The operative. So he's a character in Serenity that just, ob just objectively goes through and just kills people. However, Kant would say that he's potentially doing the right thing because he's doing his duty. He acts how he believes others in his situation should act. He kills people saying that if you were in my position, you would do the same. And that's what Kant believes. You should use people as ends, not means. So as opposed to maybe you use someone to get something, you should just use this person for what they are. They should just be there. And the operative does the same thing. He just kills them because they're there. And that's terrible. He's just mindlessly killing people. He's going after these people for no other reason than his government told him to. That's wrong, isn't it? But... There we go. Um, but with Kant, Kant would argue he's technically doing the right thing because he is not thinking about the consequences. He's just doing his duty. So Kantian ethics, I mean, on the surface, it sounds fine. A black and white definition of right and wrong, you just do your duty. But I think as the operative shows that actually you really need to consider what your duty entails before you think you're doing the right thing. So last but not least, we've got war and ethics. Now, this is obviously a huge topic, but 
I'm going to focus on two approaches to how you might consider the ethical approaches of war. And we're actually going to look at Stargate for this one, um, as I think they actually have the best kind of consideration of war and peace. our ways any longer. Nor should we. The Ori have amassed armies and moved to destroy us. Everything we believe, all we are, is an affront to them. They will stop at nothing to destroy every last shred of evidence that opposes their fanaticism. We have no choice. We've tried to argue reason. We can fight. Use what we know to oppose them. We are so few compared to them. The Ark can change everything. Is forced indoctrination really the answer? You would deny the Ori the very essence of self. It is no different than the murder they propose. The only moral way to change someone's mind, make them see the truth as you put it, is to present evidence. We believe in the systematic understanding of the physical world through observation and experimentation, through argument and debate, but most of all, freedom of will. I will not compromise the fundamental tenets of my devotion in order to preserve it. We acknowledge the incredible potential of the technology of the Ark. And the danger such power presents. It will not be used as a weapon against the Ori. The debate on the issue is closed. That's the intro to Stargate Arc of Truth. And to give you a quick basis of that, the Ori are basically these religious fanatics who are proposing war. And these Alterans take a point of view called realism in opposed to war. And they realism basically presumes that there is no place for ethics and morals in war. There, there's just no point. So what they try to do is they try to objectively see the benefits and horror of war. And that's what they were doing there. They were seeing that the benefits of fighting would mean to be taking away what the Ori essentially are and disrespecting their faith, whereas to go to war basically means that they would kill them. And so in the end, they decide that actually they can't fight. There is no benefit. And so they flee. They end up being killed out. So that probably wasn't the best option to take. Um, so obviously several years, thousands, millions, a long time passes and the American teams start to fight these um, religious zealots, basically. And they, take, they go to war. But obviously, you have to consider whether it's right to go to war. And there is actually an ethical way of deciding this. And this is called the just war theory. And this is split into three parts. And the first one of which is jus ad bello, obviously Latin. And, that's, and that is the ethics of going to war. And they basically give you all these conditions. And if you can fulfill these conditions, you are actually having a justified and essentially right war, if that's the right thing to say. So I'll grab my notes, because I can't even remember them. Um, so for the beginning, you ad bello, you have the just cause. So for this, the just cause is to free hundreds of people from being oppressed. That seems OK, right? Whereas maybe on the Ori, their reason to go to war is to just kill people. That's not a just war. So you also have things like legitimate authority. Are you, you, know, are you going to war because some guy on a street corner said, hey, go and fight that guy? Or are you listening to the government who say, actually, we need to go to war? You also have the right intention and likelihood of success. Are you going to war for the right reasons? Are you going to liberate people? Or are you just going to go and shoot some people? Are you sure that you're going to win. There is no point going to war if you know you're going to die, like the Alteran said. Um, so obviously there's a lot more categories, but then you have jus in bello, which is the ethics of conduct in war. So apparently you can actually be ethical while you fight. That doesn't sound quite likely, but if you followed the conditions of proportionality, that means that if someone guy shoots you, you really shouldn't be chucking a grenade back. That's not essentially fair, apparently. Um, discrimination and non-combatant immunity means basically you discriminate between those who are fighting you and those who are running away. You, know, you don't shoot the people who are running because they have no part in this war. Um, respect your weapon laws. So obviously in sci-fi, weapon laws are a bit dodgy considering the galaxies may have different ideas. I, I, yeah. So we kind of throw that one out of the window for this one. And obviously fair treatment of prisoners of war. You know the bad guys never treat these guys, the, 
people they capture right. So obviously, maybe you are on the right side for supporting them. Um, and then you have use post bellum, which is the ethics of ending a war and peace agreements. And again, proportionality is one of the biggest things with the just war theory. You have to be making sure that you aren't going over the top because if some guy surrenders, you shouldn't shoot him through the head. That's not proportional to ending a war. Again, you have discrimination and punishments. You have to be able to discriminate between the people you're punishing. There's no point punishing civilians because they had nothing to do with it. You need to punish like the leaders and the soldiers potentially for what they've done. You also have compensation and rehabilitation in the um, use post bellum. And this is to make sure that the right people are getting the right help. And you, know, you compensate those who have lost what war has taken away from them. So overall, these just war theories is, if you can fulfill all this criteria, then you are actually doing it right. Obviously, it's nearly impossible to fill all this criteria, and there's never such a thing as a just war. The third option is obviously pacifism, where you expect that you must follow your morals and you should not fight. We've experienced in sci-fi, pacifism doesn't happen very often. So <laughs> that is the whistle-stop tour of ethics, using sci-fi as your examples. Um, feel free to come and nab me after this. I will happily talk about ethics or sci-fi. Um, thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much. Um, if anybody wants to volunteer for, um, oh, are we, have we got any questions? Any questions? No. No. Um, oh. Okay. If you got, if you want questions, that's fine. But. Yeah, it's just this small thing. You talk about Kantian ethics and how supposedly because this man was doing his duty for his government by killing all these people that he was doing the right thing. Now, forgive me if I'm wrong here because I didn't take philosophy and ethics, but wasn't Kant a big person for universalization, the idea that you should look at what would happen if everyone did this? And surely then you would look at it and say that if everyone got rid of all the bad, attempted to kill everyone who they thought was a bad element in society, you would end up murdering the entire human race because you'd murder these people and then the next layer would become Yeah, and that, that's exactly what Kant attempted to say. You know, he tried to get his ethical theory out there. He was like, you know, everyone should act like everyone else universalization however one of the main problems is universalization is non-applicable you cannot get any moral rules that everyone around the world can follow i mean if you said no one should eat meat that wouldn't be fair you know if you try to obey religious laws and say kill the bad people it doesn't work so i think that's again but the operative says he knows he's doing wrong because obviously everyone can't act like that but no you've got a perfectly good point but again that just proves that can't didn't have it right universalization is just one of those things you can't do. Any other questions? Or are we all good? All good. Okay, thank you guys. <laughs>